Hello everyone, how are you going? And welcome to Who Owns the Arctic Ocean? Something that I've never really thought about because when I think of the Arctic, I think of the Arctic, not the Arctic Ocean. This is the Arctic Ocean, a beautiful, treacherous, and increasingly desirable body of water surrounding the northern pole of planet Earth. Mm. But who owns this remote wilderness? And can countries even own oceans? The continued warming of the Arctic has brought this, the smallest of the world's oceans, into the limelight as a new frontier yeah. for fishing, natural resource exploration, and shipping. These three industries have made ownership over this polar region an enticing prospect for those countries off its coast. The Arctic Ocean is bordered by Iceland, Greenland as part of the Kingdom of Denmark, <laughs> Canada, the United States, Russia, and Norway. Oh, look at that. There are some serious plays in this game, you know, between Canada having a major amount of the north and then the USA just tagging along as well through Alaska. And then, of course, Russia just having, well, the longest coastline I can imagine in the north or the longest realistic coastline, not island coastline. And then even though these other countries are way smaller than the big three up here, they're still a major place on the world stage. You know, Norway is a massively rich country, especially because of their fossil fuel exports. And so, of course, when you start talking about fishing and natural resources and even shipping, you can really see how this circular ocean would just be a major player. This makes Norway the only country to stake a territorial claim over both part of the Arctic and part of the Antarctic. Oh, really? Like the Antarctic, the Arctic is an inhospitable place. Mm. There are few large seaports around the coastline to assist if ships run into trouble. The coastal areas are shallow and unfamiliar, not to mention the constant hazard of large floating chunks of ice. Oh, yeah. In winter, the sun never rises, making it a virtually pitch black frozen waste. <laughs> and in summer, the sun never sets, but brings with it rain, snow and fog. Sounds pretty bleak. Yeah, absolutely bleak. Basically as bleak as we're seeing now. And to be fair, even though he said that summer brings those kind of conditions, I can only imagine they're also kind of prevalent in winter as well. And so all of a sudden you're just dealing with those. And then it's also just pitch black as well. And so I don't know how you really navigate that and how you just don't hit every single iceberg up there. Because I'm sure a ship would just feel like a magnet to icebergs. But the ongoing warming of the climate of the Earth has reduced the amount of sea ice in recent decades. Whoa. If this well, hang on a second. Taking this back, I mean, that's also an incredible one as well, but I just do want to see this graph here. Why is it such up and down? I guess the record started in 1978 and then it's just gone up and down every single year. I don't really know how you do that. Maybe through satellite imagery, you're just kind of taking photos and calculating it that way. But look at the drop in 2012. It was made in 2019, okay? So that makes sense why we don't even have records of 2020 yet. But my goodness, that is an insane graph. You really see how quickly it's dropped off. If this trend continues, Less sea ice will provide that. easier access for oh ships during goodness. more months of the year, which will increase like the accessibility of fishing and drilling and shipping. Yeah. New shipping routes may also yeah. become safe for more ships in decades to come, as yeah, well man. as the possible discovery of yet undiscovered natural resources. But with so many that? countries vying for such a small ocean, mm. where do the maritime boundaries of each country lie? True. And how do we decide who gets what? For the answer, we need to look to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Wow, there is actually something, or actually, I guess, of course, there is something, especially when it deals with an entire ocean. But it is interesting to me that when you have such a tiny ocean that is so circular, you know, and especially over here, let's say with Alaska and Russia just joining, like, that's not going to be two countries that want to get along and go, okay, fine, you can have that part. No, 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 that's not going to be happening. And so I guess that is where the United Nations have to step in and actually just draw a line. But then I don't think anyone is allowed to own, or I don't think anyone does own an entire ocean. And so I can only imagine there's going to be international waters. But then if people do want to be controlling that and also using it for its resources and everything else then how does that come into it because you can't just be stealing from one another or it's going to end poorly and so i guess overall i just do not envy these people because they have to make some seriously tough decisions and have some seriously difficult conversations but i do think they need a little bit of a shorter title because united nations convention on the law of the sea is pretty much a mouthful 12 nautical miles or about 22 kilometers off the coast of a country are the territorial waters right. on the territorial waters the laws of that country apply 22 kilometers further is the contiguous zone. This is now international waters, but that country still controls customs laws, fiscal laws, immigration laws, and pollution laws. Beyond the contiguous zone is the exclusive economic zone. The exclusive economic zone, or EEZ, can extend to 370 kilometers or 200 nautical miles off that country's coastline. Within this zone, that country has exclusive rights to any resources, including fishing and drilling. Right. This is what the exclusive economic zones look like in the Arctic. Oh, that is a perfect map. That is exactly what I wanted. I do want to get rid of the flag so then it's easier to see, but my goodness, look at that. And even just Russia having a couple of the islands just really extends its reach, doesn't it? I mean, Greenland also has a massive prowess up here. And then I do love how they just kind of smush themselves together just all the way up into the Arctic Circle. But then I guess the USA has less than I thought, but I guess Alaska is only small. That's Norway's territory, I guess, is what he's alluding 
between two here, but my goodness, that also extends Norway's prowess into them massively because otherwise, yeah, they really wouldn't be kind of touching the circle, would they? But it's interesting to hear about international waters because I've never heard anything about that, you know? It's always just portrayed as some just free zone, you do whatever you want, but that never really made sense. And so it makes sense how you can have customs laws, fiscal laws, immigration laws, and pollution laws just being tangled up in that entire thing. But it's not quite that simple. Because an exclusive economic zone is in international waters, yeah. the territory isn't actually owned by a country. But remember, right. ownership isn't just about territory for territory's sake. Countries are content to have control over the fishing and drilling and shipping. Mm. So while the EEZs are not owned, they can be exploited exclusively by their controlling country. Although it is right. worth noting that ships should still have freedom of navigation for innocent passage, such as shipping. Yeah, okay. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea takes the EEZ one step further though, which somewhat complicates things for the Arctic. Oh, no. If a country can prove that its continental shelf extends beyond the 370 kilometer distance oh, of the economic no. zone, that country also gets exclusive rights to those minerals on the continental shelf seabed and below. Oh wow, alrighty then. Well, you can see even from that map, I don't know if he's about to show it. No, it doesn't look like he is. So you can see all the continental shelves, how far out they really do go. Look at this. I can only assume that's what he's talking about or what this map is showing. And so that really just extends Russia's presence even more. And then I can only assume it doesn't then extend an extra EEZ after the continental shelf because then you just have countries just keep going and going and going and going. I mean, poor Canada kind of got stems on their continental shelf as theirs is very, very short. But like I was saying, Norway and Russia just get massive control and that is going to be where so many viable resources are you know generally people don't want to be drilling exactly where the deepest part of the ocean is because it's just more accessible it's more difficult and a lot more money to do to hopefully accomplish the same task and so i wonder why these guys did it in the first place or what was the first use case where they went okay we actually need this to be in effect because all of a sudden you now have to come up into the arctic and go hang on a second we already had issues with eez's and then now we have to deal with this law as well if a country can prove that its continental shelf extends beyond the 370 kilometer exactly. distance of the economic zone, that country also gets exclusive rights to those minerals right. on the continental shelf seabed and below. Yeah. However, this is not an extension of the EEZ and so does not include exclusive rights to fishing. Okay. This has led to several Sorry. countries considering extending their claims to various portions of the Arctic seabed, including okay. regions which overlap with each other. It seems these disputes should be easy to settle but the continental shelves of the Arctic have not been fully mapped yet and countries tend to undertake their own research. So each <laughs> oh, yeah. claim has to be assessed individually yeah, by the yeah, UN. Yeah. Of course they do. They just go, um, hey, yeah, what's a couple thousand kilometers between friends? You know, it's just, I'm over here, you're over there. You won't check this. I can't check it because it's kind of inhospitable and just uncheckable. And there's about 50 kilometers, or I guess once upon a time, there's 50 kilometers of ice right here. And so, yeah, there's not much we can do about it. We're just going to take a guess instead. Meanwhile, you're just all of a sudden having continental shelves that apparently extend halfway into New Zealand and things. You go, hang on a second, how did that happen? You go, oh, whoops, I guess we now own the entire world. But no, that seriously does seem as though it is just fraught with danger, just having all of these different countries countries individually report where their boundaries are like of course people are going to just push the boundaries as far as possible and I feel as though even in the best case situation where you're not going to war over it or anything like that you're still going to have so many headaches even from a logistical point of view. If we add the current and possible future continental wow. shelf claims by Arctic countries That's the Arctic insane. Ocean starts to look very crowded. Oh, yeah. So thanks to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and an unending appetite for resources as the Arctic melts it gets more and more economically important. For example, the shipping route between Japan and New York is about 19% shorter going via the Arctic Ocean and Canada's Northwest Passage compared to going via the Panama Canal. Whoa, what? Wait, I need to listen to it again, even though he just said it. For example, the shipping route between Japan and New York shipping is about 19% shorter 19%. going by the Arctic Ocean and Canada's okay. Northwest Passage compared to going via the Panama Canal. Yeah, for some reason I thought he said 19 kilometers or 19,000 kilometers and then nothing added up in my head but 19% shorter. Look at that. You'd never really think it, would you? Because even though it does make sense that that can be shorter, you'd go, okay, well, surely they put the Panama Canal in to make it the shortest possible reasonable route. But in this particular instance, for it to be a 20% shorter trip makes a huge difference. I mean, it's also going to be the same thing for everything coming out of China. And I think also the Panama Canal costs money to kind of book in a time slot and to use. And so I don't know how that would change it. Maybe it would become a less valuable and less expensive to use a Panama Canal if you have all these ships going up and around instead. Yeah, here we go. Pay canal fees. The biggest variable is based on the size of your boat. That definitely makes sense. But the transit toll for under 50 foot is $800. But that's not shipping size. And then we come down here. Do ships have to pay to use a Panama Canal? Tolls are set up by Panama Canal Authority. Tolls for the largest cargo ships can run about $450,000. Now, I guess that isn't massive money when you're talking about international shipping. You know, they spend billions of dollars a year just on 
fuel, but at the same time, $450,000 if you have 10, 50 ships a day, and that is just to one company, then you were certainly going to be accumulating a fairly large bill very quickly, and so to be saving fuel and time by going up and over and not paying that, I'm sure people would love to do it. And the route between Japan and Northwest Europe is about 30% shorter than wow. via the Indian Ocean and the Suez Canal. Wow. One report suggests that thanks to increased sea ice melting, large-scale shipping through the Arctic will be viable by the year 2040. 2040. So the answer to the question who owns the Arctic Ocean is complex and still evolving. Yeah. Will countries most likely argue for whatever is in their favour? Definitely. Which is why, as globalisation continues and the world becomes smaller, it will be even more important to ensure that portions of the Earth remain protected. Yeah. As fishing and drilling and shipping increase in the Arctic in the future, it will also be more important than ever to protect the wildlife that may already be struggling there. Oh, what do you mean may already be struggling? It's already struggling now, let alone in 2040 when it's like all of a sudden the ice is gone so now we can ship through there. Like, the ice is gone, people. There is no wildlife left. I mean, yeah, from a purely economic standpoint, there are a couple of countries in particular that stand to gain a lot from just that kind of exploitation of the Arctic Circle, but otherwise there is just so much to lose. For now, it's up to the UN to decide if countries and corporations get exploitation rights over disputed areas of the Arctic or if these areas belong to you. But not just to you, to everyone. Exactly. The UN aims to ensure the preservation of unclaimed natural areas for the common heritage of all mankind. Yeah. That means that. you. That means us. And surely that is worth so much more than just getting a few more litres out of the ground. You know, the only reason we are remotely interested in going up there is just to take stuff from it. We are never looking at giving. We are never looking at even protecting or just abstaining. No, everything has to be from a parasitic point of view. You know, you look at that, you go, ah, there's not enough damage there. Let's just do some more. Let's just really wait another 10 years or another 20 years, wait till all the ice melts, and then we just have free reign. Like, it's such a weird mentality, surely. And so even though this video was made in 2019, he makes it out as though the urine is sitting on the fence going, oh, I don't really know. We're just unsure. We don't know which one we want to do. We're really, come on. Surely it's the UN. The UN is fairly progressive and they should know what to do and they should just do it. They go, okay, no EEZs up here. No one has a continental shelf that extends up into the Arctic. And if for some reason you absolutely have to come up here, then it, you have to put in like a thousand to one money. You know, every dollar you make from this area, you have to put a thousand back into the world. Just make it completely uneconomically viable to do anything at all. And just so people go, okay, I'll leave it alone. I'll go somewhere else or maybe not at all hopefully. And even though a whole bundle of countries do have their names and claims in the Antarctic hat, as far as I'm aware they're all scientific hats and so why not do the same thing to the Arctic Circle, the Arctic Ocean and just the Arctic in general. But anyway in saying that I reckon I'm going to call it there so thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it feel free to do the YouTube algorithmic things down below. Also if this is the first video of mine that you are watching then make sure to go check out any other ones I've done. Also make sure to go check out the original video down in the description below or hey maybe you even just want to consider subscribing so that you don't miss another one of these in the future. But all in all have a good one and see ya.